Today on the People Nova podcast, we have a loving conversation about the soul to soul work it takes to connect with self and others. Yes, love. Love is being truthful and honest. First with ourselves, how do we cultivate self love? How do we replenish our inner cup of joy? Next, with others. How do we cultivate love for others? How do we earn consent for important conversations? We discuss a few pragmatic approaches to these and other topics with Adrian Jefferson, culture and arts thought leader. Let's get started. Hey everyone, welcome back to the People Nova podcast. My name is Rachel O'Neill, and today I am here with an amazing woman, an arts advocate. I cannot wait to jump into this conversation. Hey, Adrian. Hi, Rachel. It's so good to see you. Good to see you too. Do a favor for us. Can you introduce yourself for our audience? Yeah, absolutely. I am Adrian Jefferson. Um, my current position is with the city of New Haven as the director of arts, culture, and tourism, or the director of arts and cultural affairs. I'm also the executive director of New Haven Festivals, which is the nonprofit arm of the department. Great. Oh, fantastic. So our podcast is about the human side of business. When you hear the phrase, you know, humans do business with other humans, what does that mean to you? Mm, I love that. When I think humans do business with other humans, I think soul to soul work, spirit to spirit work. I think that we all come from such differing backgrounds. And a lot of times that's the barrier to how we connect with somebody. Yeah. But when you release that and you see somebody from their soul, you're able to connect as a, as a, as a related person, you have that connectivity. I really want to see people through a lens of empathy and, yeah. um, and understanding opposed to like, just how society says, you know, like the cut off cancel culture society. That's not really how I'm trying to see people. How did you get that orientation? How do we help people kind of like open up? Well, I, I don't know. Cause I think it's different for everybody. I think you almost have to go through life and have somewhat of a revelation, right? And that <laughs> happens at different times for different people. People will be ready when they're ready. Yeah. And, um, and I think that soul work usually comes from a personal experience. Have you ever heard the saying that the nicest people have been through the hardest times and they're able to be nice and so loving because they don't want people to experience what they have. The yeah. things that I've been through have allowed me to have empathy and to go deeper and to try to understand what's going on. And we had to go through those things to get to a point where we can give that revelation to someone else. It sounds very, very similar. Um, have you heard of the work of Ashanti Branch and the mask you live in? No, no. He's an educator out in Oakland. He works with um, Black and Latinx youth, and he has this program, Million, Million Masks. And so he has um, young men write on just a piece of paper, like art interactive thing, you know, what are, the, what are the emotions you show people? You know, what's on your mask, right? You let the world see this, but then obviously there's something behind the mask, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. you're not showing people. It gets to that soul work, right? And just acknowledging that each of us is, is wearing this kind of mask, right? Because we were told or society, you know, expectations or. Mm. I think of black men and um, how so often in culture and society has said, you got to be overly masculine, right? You can't be vulnerable, that there's no space for a Black man to do that. Mm -hmm. And it's very harmful. Like that narrative and that rhetoric is very harmful for Black men, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, who, for, for everyone. For, for everyone. For everyone. everyone. Why can't we treat other humans with, as, as empathetic beings? How do I share with the people in my world that like, okay, something's going on, right? Like yep. parents or kids and like, mm. Maybe, I, you know, something else is stressing me out. So I'm not like, mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not ah, self-caring. Yeah. Self-care. I always think about when you're just self-aware, right? That allows you to communicate better. That allows you to be conscious of what you're going through, but also be very cognizant of how that impacts how you are communicating and relating to others. And when you need to take a step back and when you don't. And that, that type of approach really works in the work environment. Um, and, and I think we need to normalize that type of self-care for people who work within institutions or outside of institutions, whatever your work is, because if we can take care 
of our self-care, imagine how much better our work would be, you know, imagine how much better our environments would be. So it really does. You're, you're spot on. It starts with self-care, self-awareness, self-love. Um, and so many times we can't love other people because we don't love ourselves truly. I like to talk about that, um, that I, I call it a cup. I don't know. Like uh, it's just a metaphor that's worked for me, right? Like that cup of like, is my cup full? Mm. Am I full of joy and self-care and self-love, right? And if not, it's going to be really hard. I call it leaky cup, right? Like if that cup is leaking, it's going to be really hard for me to be able to empathize with other, another person because mm. shit, I'm not taken care of. Like, why am, I, why am I giving more of my cup to someone else? Like, okay, great, mm. great signal. Can I ask you a question? Oh, because yeah. I'm curious about that. Um, what does self love look like? If you had to break it down in a pragmatic way, what what is that, and what does it look like? Mm. How how I talk to myself. Mm. I, and I had to tell my therapist this. I told him I was like, I promise it's not Fight Club. <laughs> <laughs> said I um I said. I, um, there's a couple different Rachel's going on in my head. <laughs> the stuff I club. Same, same with me. Okay. All right. Great. The way that I talk to myself and I give a very specific example I'll share with everyone. Right. I know, uh, very simple. I have to make sure that, that I'm fed. So what can I do? Right. Well, I can make up a, a batch of my favorite, whatever, and I can put leftovers in the freezer. And then when I'm super busy and like, blah, 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 I can just take it out of the freezer and like shove it in and, and feed myself. Right. And so that's how these are the, here's the, here's the fight club reference, right? What can today Rachel do so that when future Rachel shows up, I can look back at past Rachel and say, oh my God, past Rachel, you put food in the freezer for me. I love you. <laughs> you no. <know. laughs> Future Rachel's gonna be hungry one day and not have time to deal with it. And you did that for me. Mm. It doesn't take away from anyone else. Mm. I love that so much, um, especially acknowledging the past versions of ourselves that still exist and actually are very real in our present selves and have a lot to do with how we make decisions and um, unhealed traumas or whatever. I love this concept of talking to past self, giving past self grace, okay? Like, <laughs> which I would say is the main word. And then being able to um, rectify that and move forward yeah. in the now and be in the now. It's so important to be present. Yeah. It's so important because our minds are crazy. Like they yeah. run all over the place. Right? And they tell us things that are not true. And that are like, not true. How do we interrupt that? And it's, and, and it's like, okay, that's not true. Mm -hmm. uh, like, I knew I was going to be hungry. So instead mm -hmm. of looking back and saying, oh, past Rachel, you're such a jerk. Why didn't you why didn't you, right? That like spiral of, we don't do it. So like, how can I interrupt that to show, mm. you know, my past self that, mm. you know, I, I love the decisions you make. I appreciate the decisions that you made, you know, at that moment, but then you know what? Past Rachel's not going to be perfect. And so how do I show that love to the mistakes mm. that did happen in the past? Right. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and you know, to bring it back to the current climate of, of racial equity and racial justice and, and you know, all the, the hurt that people are feeling, right? Like I talk with white people about racism because mm. look, we have to talk about it. And mm -hmm. yeah, things happen in the past that are sad, that are, you know, maybe we made an embarrassing a comment. Maybe we, you know, said something that offended, you know, a black or Latinx person. Like, okay, that's the, that happened. We have to acknowledge that. And be sad for that, but it, it can't paralyze us from trying and learning and doing better and seeing mm. other people as as humans because we all have that cup of joy. We all have that cup of joy. So yes, I I love that approach. It's very different. Um, I like that and I respect it so much because I do think that when we approach racial equity work and anti-racism work, you know, decolonizing anything, right? Yeah. 
it has to start from a place of love and it has to start from a place of internalized work because at the end of the day you know we can say all of this stuff that needs to change that our systemic stuff that needs to change through policy but at the end of the day people uphold systems systems don't uphold systems Mm -mm. people uphold systems yep so it's that hard work that really needs to happen if we're ever going to change like anything right and that always comes from a place of critical love. <laughs> what I would yeah. say is, you know, very critical love. Um, a friend of mine, Yolanda, who facilitates around this work, she right. says critical love. And she, that's one of her top elements out of like all of these different phases of how to do racial uh, justice work. Yeah. And she has in there, especially for, you know, white allies, because we're not trying to beat up on you, right? We're not trying to beat up on you. We're saying, this is what the truth is. This is literally the history, right? Right. But now let's approach it from a way of like, we're going to be honest and we're going to love you. But a lot of times love is being truthful, being truthful, being honest. And so that's why it all roots down to that, which ultimately for me, all roots down to your heart, which all roots down to what we're talking about, about just like self-care, self-love, understanding, internalizing things a little bit more. Um, we met at a um, arts administrator of color uh, event. In we New- did. There were, I think it was a group from New York City of a college age women who talked about the words we use in, yeah, race and equity. And they went through this whole exercise to, to ask the room, right? Um, what words do you use to describe yourself, right? And why do you choose one phrase over another phrase, right? And how those choices, you know, are impactful. And the speaker said. I have to describe myself in pejorative terms in mm. order to get funding to share my love and my art with the world. And that was visceral for me. Yes, I remember that session. I was in that session. I have to say <laughs> about what you just said about essentially this person having to describe themselves in a certain terms just to get money highlights the problem with our philanthropy system. 100%. And, it, and yeah, it does. And it highlights the problem with our funding system and funders. It's highly problematic because all it does is perpetuate a system. Yeah. And um, somebody said to me very clearly, they said, um, if we're writing a grant, right? You're writing a grant. You're talking about the constituents you serve in that grant. Think about the language you're using to describe them. Would the people you're serving if they look at this grant, identify with how you're describing them, would they call themselves at risk? Would yeah. they call themselves underrepresented with those words, the word under, why are we under, right? Like certain words that she literally, the way you just described, picked, picked them out and broke them down. It was like, this is why it's problematic. And now we ask people to apply for money and we wanna see these words, which just perpetuate stereotypes and systems. And, and we don't even, and we're just doing it so regularly, we're not even noticing we're doing it. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a connective thing there. And yes, that was absolutely my favorite session as well. Yeah. yeah. She's also on my like dream podcast guest. I, can, I would love to like have that chat with her. Yeah. yeah. I'll try and go through my notes. Maybe, maybe the universe will, will do that. I think for me, that was the first time it ever even like sunk in because if you remember there was a lot of young progressives in that room yeah. when I yeah, young young and now when I say y'all I'm talking about like 19 2 and 21 very young who oh, were yeah. like I don't identify as African-American black American or or I'm indigenous or I'm you know and they were just breaking down how they've been boxed in right to as we are often as people of color or black and brown people boxed in like we're all the same and we're not and so it was the first time I ever heard the conversation go so specific as to the many different ways and the spectrum and the diversity within black and brown people how it can be described on how they want to be identified and it's not all the same mm-hmm. and uh, it's that's something I find oh you're about to make me go but i'm going to say this without being too long-winded that's something that i find when it comes to how this newer generation would like to be identified right compared to older people who are still holding on to these terms that are offensive they don't realize it's offensive but we're in a new generation we're in a new world and there's just major generational gap that exists within this conversation around race 
Yeah. And it's, it's another thing that further perpetuates the system. Yeah. I wonder, this is a hypothetical. Do you, is it, is it the older generation saying, look, I worked really hard to learn this colonial system and I, and I'm going to make it work. So don't change it because otherwise it'll eviscerate all of my success. Oh, you hit the nail on the head. You hit the nail on the head and just kind of said it more eloquently than I would have said it. Yes, I think that's what it is. I actually think that, and I went, I'm not going to categorize that, categorize the entire, you know, older generation. But what I will say is there are people who do not want to pass the baton because they have finally got it to a place where it feels equitable for their own individual experience. So now it's about them. And there are people who are okay with being tokenized. They are, they are okay with it because they're getting ahead. And they miss the fact that it's not about you getting ahead. It's about all of us getting ahead. Because one story does nothing for us. We need to address the collective and what it's doing as a collective. How are we pushing forward agendas that work for us and that are really going to impact decolonization, dismantling, and anti-racist practices in Mm -hmm. in real life. Mm -hmm. And so I I think that what you just said is actually one of the major problems. Yeah, it's it works for me, so I'm good with it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I figured out how to toggle these, you know, levers and boxes and things. Yeah. Like, oh my God, don't get rid of them. Because if you get rid of them, like I won't be successful or or we should be good, we should be happy with them. It's we got to make some leeway, leeway, right? So it's, we should be happy with what we're handed and we could deal with the rest later. Let's just get in there, right? And I, I understand in a sense that, I understand in the sense that, but I just don't think that we should just be accepting anything that's handed to us anymore. I, I just, we're, we're in a whole different age. That's not going to work anymore. It's not going to work, right? So like, how do we reconfigure grants? Um, and grants applications, right? Um, And one of the things that, um, you know, quite poignantly as the the racial um, justice work was was coming to a head in the country, you know, one of the things that, um, oh, sorry, I'll be really, really specific. So I help coach uh, Black and Latinx entrepreneurs through um, a program called Optima. They're based in- I've seen that. I love Optima. no, 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 that's a different one. <laughs> oh, you're doing so much. I do. Um, and one of my fellow instructors, you know, I started talking about like adult learning theory and it's like one of my favorite things. I nerd out on it, right? And I just want to make sure that everyone can learn in a way that like makes sense for them. And one of the other instructors was like, yeah, those are actually based on colonial constructs. And I'm like, oh, mm. like, okay, like, thanks. I didn't have that lens, right? And so I was like, I was struggling and I'm like, okay, if that's a, um, it's almost like a thorn, like, all right, let me take that thorn out. And it's not that I need to replace that thorn. It's like, all right, let me take that out. And then like, how do I still help people, people learn in a way that's genuine to them? Like, is there different frameworks, right? Like, how do we reinvent that? Mm. Or or is it just building up their self-esteem? and building up their love and, and showing them affection during the learning mm. process. I don't know. Well, I think it's twofold. I think that, yes, we have to build up people's love and self-esteem. And while I do think that that's priority, we also have people who are dealing with a very real reality of inequities and things that they can't wait <laughs> for, you know, the self-esteem to be built. Like there's, if there's things, but maybe my self-esteem will be a little bit more if this over here was a little bit more um, accessible to me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I think that we, in, it's a combination of two things that need yeah. to happen at the same time. It's a combination of what you, of what you said, because I, 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 I'll say something that has been resonating with me since somebody said it, a really good friend of mine wrote on Facebook <laughs> and she was, okay. and she said, white people are sitting in coffee shops having conversations about race in safe spaces black people are still on the streets dying and to me that resonated because you can take that and you literally can apply that to any 
any type of situation, whether it's an entrepreneurship program or whether it's a housing, we're talking about housing and a program that's being launched, that is the reality is that sometimes people just don't even have the space to get that knowledge, don't have the access to it. And even if they do, what's going on in their everyday life that might even be a barrier into how they're receiving information. It might be a barrier. There's like other things that are elements that are still in some way Mm -hmm. affecting maybe um, the, the education of that person or just the livelihood of that person. So it has to be multiple approaches happening at one time, if that makes any, um, any sense. It does. It absolutely does. Um, it's, uh, I, I point out white privilege to, to my white friends, right. As simple as sitting in a coffee shop, like, come on people. Like, yeah. The fact that you're able to, um, order all your food and have it delivered, like, you are living a very comfortable life. Yeah. 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 And the fact that you even can take the time to sit and talk about it and um, feel safe while doing yeah. it. That's right. a privilege. Uh, as opposed to, <laughs> right. As opposed to someone, you know, maybe overhearing a conversation between, you know, two black people about race. Right. And then white people start to have, oh, white fragility. There it is. Right. Like, oh, no, they're talking about something that's making me uncomfortable. Comfortable. Like, okay. Yeah. So, so since um since we're both we're talking about art, right? Um one of my favorite questions that I love to ask all of my uh all of my guests is um what's your favorite art? Oh uh, that's so hard. Do you mean my favorite form of art? It can be it can be a form, a modality, a medium, an actual piece, a specific piece, right? And and I'll give you a minute to think, right? And sort out all your options because you have so much exposure to a lot of different options. There's a quote by Darren Walker. He's the CEO of the Ford Foundation. Mm-hmm. And he says, without art, there is no empathy. And without empathy, there is no justice. Mm. I love that. And it's true. <laughs> and without artists, there are there is no movement. There, right. Right. All connected. Um that's a tough one. I would have to say, if I had to be specific about a piece of art that has impacted my life the most, it's actually a portrait of Malcolm X Ooh. that um and uh, the artist. It, the name is not in my brain right now, but it's a portrait of Ma- Malcolm X. We've all seen this portrait. He's um, looking out the window. He's at the window with the gun yeah. and looking yeah. out to protect his family. Oh. And obviously that started off as a picture, but I've seen it. this in a portrait that actually hangs in a good friend of mine's house. And I just cannot remember the artist who did it, um, a, re- a rendition of that uh, picture. But that for me, honestly, is probably my favorite piece of artwork ever. And I think for me though, it's just because it's really personal. Like it's the story of Malcolm X is a story I've known since I was six years old Mm -hmm. and I've been exposed to since I was six. And um, his radicalism and his revolutionary mindset has always been, honestly, like I just, I admire that man so much and it's always been really impactful in my work. And so, for me, that picture though humanizes him, and it humanizes him because he's protecting his family. That's why he was at the window with his gun and looking out. And it made me just think about, well, what was he going through internally? Was he afraid? Mm-hmm. Was he um, feeling betrayed? What what was he experiencing from a human soul perspective? That's actually probably and this is the first time I've ever actually thought about it. I, I love so much stuff that I'm like, I don't know. Um, but <laughs> Malcolm, Malcolm X, that picture of Malcolm X. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. What about you? Um, nobody's ever asked me. Well, you put me on the spot, so I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> uh, I love it. I love it. Um, I'm actually incredibly inspired. Uh, I saw a piece at, it was a very specific piece at the ICA, Institute of Contemporary Art. It was a sculpture, series of wires. Um, hanging from the ceiling and it had different bits of charred wood attached Mm. to them and it was just in a in a very um Mm. kind of abstract right 
and it was uh, it was an artist. Uh, I think it's Cornelia Parker. Uh, the name of the art piece is "Hanging Fire Suspected Arson," and it actually leverages um, a Japanese technique called shosugi ban, which um, burns wood. So shosugi ban was created in Japan. So this is like my favorite modality. And this is the, the art that I produce um, because that shosugi ban, it, it carbonizes the wood. It doesn't destroy it. Everyone likes to think of fire and flame as destructive, mm. but, but it's really transformational and mm. it transforms the wood um, into a, a preserved piece, just mm. made carbon protects it right that that inner the inner cup of joy is protected oh my god here we go meta mm, mm. that sounds beautiful yeah it almost reminds me of the guy who did uh, who, who they featured in just mercy um the story of just mercy um uh, brian that, stevenson thank you yeah he also has a new museum that is um it's commemorating and remembering all of the places all across the na nation where lynching took place. And there's these, you walk through this pathway, this open pathway that has a ceiling with these like poles hanging down and then these wood bearings hanging down on different levels that represent all of the bodies and the people. And when I tell you, I haven't seen it in person, I've seen it online, it is breathless taking and um, each city can claim they can claim their their uh block. Um, yeah. and and the name of the victims are yeah. on the block yeah, yeah, yeah incredibly impactful yeah what you would describe kind of it's different but it reminds me of that i don't know why yeah no that's that's what art's supposed to do it's supposed to trigger different you know feelings and 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 you know at the start of the show i i talked about um ashanti branch and the mask within right and yes here, and you mentioned the portrait of malcolm x like what is he feeling inside right behind the mask mm. which which i think again if we can we can identify with each other as soulful beings that are that are having these feelings within the mask then we can really start to identify with Mm. humanity. I think art is a really great example to like really explore what are those poignant pieces for you and what are those pieces that that resonate? Mm. How do we keep that feeling uh, of love? I mean, I think art at the end of the day, art connects us all. And um, as cliche as that sounds, it's actually the truth. It, it um, allows us to connect to people in ways that we may, may um, have never thought that we would be able to connect a person. It allows us to humanize people. I keep saying humanize because it's true. Um, okay. It allows us to have conversation with people we're conflicted with um, because art is subjective. And so it, it's very in perspective on what we're looking at, right? And so that's also how, like if we view the world as art, if we view conversations as art, if, if we view everything, even conflict as art, then we can actually approach it from a way that allows us to get to the root of things because of the fact that it's all subjective, right? Yeah. It, and none of it really is, well, this is just my opinion. <laughs> none of it really is real. Like at the end of the day, right? There's yin, there's yang, like which I'm like, right? There's things just are. And then there's perspective mm -hmm. around what is. And then there's actually what is like there, there, there's actually what is and a lot of times it's what you said like we're making up these things in our mind that perpetuate conflict that perpetuate all of these different things when really that's just our perspective what is is this is here's mm -hmm. the concrete fact opposed to all of these other abstract thoughts we're having around it and so i think art allows us to tackle that the root of the root of that mm -hmm. and um being able to understand the varying perspective and then really being able to to scale it back and see well what, what is it really and um, yeah, I don't, yeah, that's the way I see it. Like literally that's the way, that's the only way I can describe it. It may be confusing to some people, but that's literally how I see it. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's fantastic. I, I really bring in um, art in, into my practice and into my world because um, it's, I finally, finally realized how important art and creativity is um, and, and recognizing that every culture mm has an art uh, medium or form mm -hmm. or, or mm -hmm. creative expression. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. Awesome. I think for me, because you got to remember in my, in my um, role here, but even in, when I was at the state, it's, it's arts and culture. And a lot of times we get so focused on arts that we leave out the culture component. Yeah. But culture really is more, it's broader than just the arts lens. Culture means everything. Like even the conversations we're talking about right now, normalizing things. It could be mental health and and trauma. It could be um, thinking about, I mean, anything. Anything literally can be culture and have a lens on how we shape and reshape something um, and how we perceive it. Um, and it can be through the arts, right? The arts is a part of this culture. You know, entertainment could be a part of this culture. Politics and economics could be a part of this culture. Mental health could be a part of this culture. Culture is really what sets the foundation for us to really realize that we are all operating essentially in one human culture and um, just figuring it all out. That allows us to broaden the playing field, to be honest. It's like that invisible, like, Uh, the air we breathe. Culture is the air we breathe, right? Like how do we talk about it? How do we move through it in a way that we can start to describe culture? Mm. That's the, you can't, you can't describe culture. That's the thing. It's, there is a space for everyone in culture. Do you know what I mean? There's a, there's a space for everyone. Um, And and I, I just like it because even when it comes to conversations, that are very um, difficult and hard. Um, I think that culture, when we're looking at it through a lens of culture, it, it really allows us to broaden why we're even having the conversation. Art is the avenue, right? It's the mm-hmm. vehicle, but changing culture, that's the why. Mm-hmm. That's the why, changing, reshaping, figuring mm-hmm. out a culture that supports all types of people, figuring out a culture that's diverse, inclusive, equitable, just, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's the why. So it's really about culture and art is part of the avenue to how we're reshaping and shifting and thinking about culture. Mm -hmm. So there's room for everyone in culture. There's room for everyone, right? It's not a binary. It's not a pie, right? Like no one is excluded. You are part of this culture. How do we, how do we get more people to understand that? (laughs) Well, I think it's about, um, and them understanding, getting them to understand, understand that we're not saying, forget your, forget your individual culture or your, where you come from or what, you know what I mean? We're not mm-hmm. saying that. What we're saying is people have sub tribes, sub groups that they operate in different semi cultures, small cultures, right? And we're not saying that you can't honor where you have come from, right? The history of who you are, you got to honor that. We're saying Think about that and how it impacts, you know, whatever, it, how does it interact with the bigger culture of what we're trying to shift and change? Mm-hmm. I think that a lot of times there's this scarcity issue that happens and it happens with all types of people, all people of no matter your color, definitely happens in the black and brown community. And definitely we see it happening with white people who think that because we're being more equitable, equitable and diverse, where's the place for me? Where, where do I exist? If I give you this, the pie is not big enough. And this is a lot of times why people don't want to bend. But mm. if we can get them to understand that, number one, the playing field has never been equal. So we're not really, we're just catching up. We're not taking from you. We're just trying to catch up. That's yeah. it. That's it, yeah. right? Right. Yeah. If we can get people to understand that we're not trying to strip you of what you have. We're not trying to strip you of what you have. We're just trying to say, let's create a culture that's equal and equitable and just for everybody. Yeah. That's it. And if, yeah. and if, and I think it starts with getting people to understand we're not trying to take from you. That's not the point here. Yeah. It's, it's been interesting to see um, my, my white friends and my white colleagues and kind of how they're um, slowly going into this conversation about, about racism. And, you know, when it comes up as a, as a, as a pie, as a binary, I'm like, Ooh, not, not so much. Right. And I, and then I shift and I start talking about growth, uh, Carol Dweck and the growth mindset, right? Like we, this is not a a fixed outcome. There was no one good. It's art. It's all subjective, right? 
it's culture. A lot of different right. things contribute to it. So um, feeling like we have to win, right? Or, or it has to be perfect. Oof, I, am, I will tell everyone I am a recovering perfectionist, right? <laughs> yeah, I get that. I get that. <laughs> And the more that um, I, you know, I think, I think I really share that with other people more to convince myself that it's okay yeah. to learn, right? And it's and it's okay to make mistakes, right? Um, because that's how, as long as we're genuine about that, right, and not mm. trying to um, oof, make other people feel the way that we might feel inside, mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. And we acknowledge that and kind of separate that, right? And that that takes a lot of self work. It does, and what you just said reminds me of the term: um, we are responsible for the energy we bring into a room. We you, we are responsible for the energy we bring into a space, or we are responsible for the energy we bring to someone else. And that's accountability. Self work takes accountability. That's why people don't always want to do it because you have to be really honest and really true (laughs) about what it is, the good and the bad within yourself. And um, I think a lot of people want to, don't want to face the truth and um, yeah, but yeah, but that's what it, but what you just said reminds me of that. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. It's um, it's interesting. I, I, um, I see the statistics on like sadness and depression and um, I have been on my own mental wellness journey. Right. And it's one of those things, like we have to talk about it. We have to normalize it. We have to acknowledge that, you know, at this point it is, you know, a health crisis, you know, with so many people feeling this way. Um, Yeah. And and it has nothing to do with the, with the likes and the external validation on, on social media. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And how many followers we have. Absolutely nothing. (laughs) Um. But, but I love how you phrase that, like the energy that we bring into the room, right? And, and how do we protect our own energy, right? And mm. if, right? Again, self-care, like what do we need to do that day? And no, maybe it is, I need to put Zoom down and like mm-hmm. Go mm-hmm. Take a nap and find food in the freezer that yesterday, Rachel, <laughs> past Rachel. So funny. <laughs> I'll come You're so that. funny with that story. <laughs> but essentially, yeah, boundaries. Boundaries. What boundaries are we boundaries are there to protect us, you know, and, mm-hmm. and to protect other people and mm. to protect others. Um, and so I think we have to create healthy boundaries with people and with work and with with anything that we're interacting in in life, you know, we have to do it. Mm-hmm. I think um, another uh, on that of like healthy boundaries and what does that look like? Um, I, I like to talk with my clients about um, conversations around consent. Mm. And so when you go into a conversation or a dynamic or like a situation, oh. like, are we all opting in to like what's happening? That's powerful, Rachel. That's, that's kind of the, fir- the first time I've heard it described like that. And I know exactly what you're saying when you say it. I'm like, oh yeah. yeah. I can't tell you how many times I've felt like I've been forced into conversations about things that I'm not That's in a place good. to talk about, but the yeah. assumption from the other person is I'm always in that space to talk about, right? You're always ready. And when I need to, you're ready. No, woof. Mm-hmm. Hey, like, can we just like make sure that we're all opting into this? One mm. of my, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. One of, one of my favorite stories about this. Um, there's a, there's an accelerator here in Boston um, that I'm, I deeply love. <laughs> And um, the CEO, I had emailed her and I was like, I have some feedback about how white your volunteer you know, portion, the arm of your organization, the volunteer portion is. If you would like to hear that, schedule time with me. Did and she? She did. That's good. I That's was really good. so proud of her. I was so, so proud of her. Right. And it's, and it's, here's what we want to talk about. And it, and, I, and again, you can opt in, you can choose your moment or you can totally not, you can, you can ignore my email and like, it is what it is, but it's not me pushing and like opening, you know, double barrel opening and like laying out on, it's just like, 
here's what I want to talk about. If you're okay with this, like, I'm going to be gentle. It's, it's a white woman CEO. Like, I'm going to be gentle about it. I'm going to be direct, you know, and, and we're going to problem solve this from a place yeah. of learning and growth as opposed to, you know, white shaming other people, which is not helpful. Mm-hmm. I think I, I like that. And I, and I, so imagine that, um, this idea of not ever receiving, um, um, what's the, what's the term you just Intent. used? Consent um, as black and brown people, never, not ever even being asked it. I think not in even. this time, not, yeah. not ever. I mean, ever. Literally, it is an assumption that because you are black, brown, you are ready to have the conversation around race. You are ready to lead the conversation around race, which is not always the case, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and the emotional toll that it has on the people who are living it is not taken into account enough. And, um, and, and, and that's why I think when you say consent, I'm like, whoa, that, that term, the way that just summed that up blue blows my mind because it describes it to a T. There has to be, there has to be, and not assumption. Yeah. 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 That's, that's my little, like, personal passion project like hey let's talk about consent like well, let's yeah. open this up like you hate when you get subscribed to newsletters and you opt out yeah. and that's why we have gdpr but like yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay white people you know how to consent mm. so that's that's gonna resonate with me all day um and like it's crazy because i actually just watched the jada pinkett red table talk about consent it, but but it wasn't about this type of consent. It was about like the um, the blurred lines between consent between women and men. Uh, um, yeah, very people talk about it, right? And that's where it's like most well known is when there's a, a romantic dynamic, right? Yeah. You know what this is just an everyday dynamic. I right? I love that, Rachel. Yeah, consent. Yeah, yes, ma'am. <laughs> you know, my two cents for what it's worth. Adrian, what's up? Ne- what's next for you? Like, let's put into the universe some good juju. Let's get some listeners reaching out to you. Like it's yeah. magical for us. So, you know, I just started in this role. I've only been here since February. And so I am riding this wave and it's been, it has been amazing. The growth that I have personally and both career wise, um, just in this very short amount of time has been so instrumental to me. Um, so I, I imagine I'll be here for a little while um, right. and I'm really loving the work I do. But I think for me, ultimately, um, the goal really is to continue this conversation in whatever medium possible around advancing racial justice and, um, and, and equity and, ju- and, um, and anti-racism practices and, and decolonizing systems. Um, also, um, for me, is really kind of looking at, I I keep saying the mediums that we do this in, but really looking at how we can break into different revolutionary modes that haven't been done yet and and really break into theories that haven't been realized yet that will really help to shift and shape culture for Black and Brown people. Um, So I'm interested in, in diving into that work I'm also considering getting my PhD. I'm really thinking about it. Yes, I've been thinking about it hard, <laughs> which would go hand in hand with what I'm kind of what I'm kind of talking about, you know. Um, but really, I just want to I want to implement change, whatever yeah. way that I'm appointed by God to do that, and mm-hmm. and that's what's for me. That's what's next. But I have a lot of things in the works and things that I'm like you know, national platform to, uh, I want a national platform to do this work on, to be able to reach as many people as I can. So I guess that's what's next. Awesome. Awesome. We're going to put that into the universe. It is going to happen. You have good energy. You have amazing energy. (laughs) Adrian, thank you so much for your time. I absolutely appreciate it. It has been lovely catching up with you. I miss you terribly. (laughs) I miss you too. I'm like, I got to get to Boston. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for joining us on the People Nova podcast. My name is Rachel O'Neill. The team here at People Nova Human Capital would love to hear from you. We are always curious to hear from our listeners. So go ahead and send us an email, podcast at peoplenovahc.com with your workplace questions or suggestions for who you'd like to see on our show. If you send us an audio memo, we may include your question on the show. Lastly, we are here to amplify. 
Our guests are amazing entrepreneurs and we want you to forward our newsletter to someone in your network who needs to know the amazing things our guests are doing so together we can make an impact. Thank you so much. Take care and we will see you next time.